If you want to do something, even if the people at the top don't look like you, you should be able to do it. I think it's important for women and LGBTQ individuals as well, and for any underrepresented individual to be in those fields because there are people from underrepresented communities that want to be in those fields. I am Amanda Wilkins. I am a postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin in mathematics. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. How would you explain your profession to somebody who's never heard of it before? There are sort of two things to explain. So one part is the postdoc part. So being a postdoc is being like a very well-paid intern, and it's like an internship for PhDs. Eventually, I would like to be a tenured professor at a research institution in math, and doing a postdoc is one thing that I have to do to get there. And the other thing to explain it is doing mathematics as a profession. That is a bit different than other fields of research because there's nothing really physical involved. I just sort of Google some things, I skim a lot of math papers and math books, and then I just kind of scribble things down in a notebook until they make sense in my head. And then I try to be able to explain them to other mathematicians in my field. The type of research that I do in math is I work in fields called Ergodic theory and probability, so probability you have heard of, but ergodic means mixing in Greek. And I work in theoretical math, which means it doesn't necessarily have any direct applications. But ergodic theory, the, the field was born from physics, like a couple hundred years ago, physicists trying to understand physical systems. And the field has evolved in that time. And what I do now is I study much more abstract versions of sort of the original systems that they studied. One of the objects that I research is called a Bernoulli shift. So if you think of the integer number line, so you have a, a, just the number line that you grew up with as a kid, and you imagine putting a coin on each vertex of that number line, and you can flip the coins, so, and it lands on heads or tails with equal probability, or since we do things abstractly, you, you could pick unequal probabilities as well. This thing is called a Bernoulli process. You can also shift that number line around, and if we talk about that more abstractly, we're talking about a group action, and that's where the ergodic thing comes in, because you can shift and mix things around. So one question is when those two objects are equal to each other in some sort of mathematical sense. I am bisexual and non-binary. I identify as a non-binary woman, but I'm not sure that makes sense to a lot of people. I mean, it's very accurate to say that I'm non-binary because I don't really identify as a woman. I certainly don't identify as a man. The, the biggest obstacle always felt to me just like being a woman or being perceived as a woman, at least explicitly. Like implicitly, I'm not sure what people were thinking. Especially in my profession, I think there's so many parts getting through life that shape me based on that identity. So I feel like, I do feel very strongly that's still part of who I am. I grew up in the suburbs of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they are pretty conservative generally, but also I grew up in a very conservative religion and Lutheranism, so that, that was another layer of conservatism. I was pretty like deeply immersed in the whole religious aspect until I was like 18 or 19 and moved away from home. Like I went to private Lutheran schools for grade school and high school and then also for my first year of undergrad until I transferred somewhere else. That whole community was like everyone believed that gay people were going to hell and like trans people were not even in our, they were a thing in the collective consciousness. My best friend is someone that I went to high school with and he didn't consciously know he was gay at the time but but now he's out and gay. Sharing that with him I think is a really big thing to share just growing up together and then both being out and queer now. The bisexuality I think was easier to figure out. It took a long time. I think I started to be aware of that maybe at the end of high school and then the non-binary part took a lot longer. I think I sort of came to terms with that sometime during the pandemic. Growing up, did you have any role models, whether that's uh, in the queer community, in the math community? I remember not having any role models. I remember that concept not really making sense to me. The first role model I had was a woman mathematician. So this was after I finished my master's. So I did my master's and then took some time off and then did my PhD. But she got her PhD from the same place I got my master's and she helped me sort of apply again and like get it back into a PhD program. She is Mexican-American and a total badass and I think she was the first 
person in math who I could really relate to. Mentorship is very important in math or in, in any career. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for a couple of very specific people, like the mentor that I mentioned before. She sort of guided me through the process of switching schools in between my master's and PhD. And she was really the first role model I had. Like she spent so much time working. She also had a child and I could just see like the amount of work that she put in. Like if she could do it, that made me feel like I could do it. And there was also a person when I was finishing up my PhD, they invited me to give a talk at their institution. And that really helped me through the process of like realizing people cared about my research and then applying to positions as I was finishing up my PhD. And they ended up writing me a letter of recommendation, which I think is definitely one of the reasons that I got the job that I have now. Mentors are hard to find. In a lot of the official mentoring spaces, it's hit or miss, like if you find someone that you click with. So maybe just sort of be, I was on the lookout for someone that you click with that is like further along in the career that you want. I was dating someone at the time and that was like a serious relationship that lasted like six years with the man and when that ended I was in Kansas for grad school and I went on like okay Cupid and Tinder and stuff like that but it was in Lawrence Kansas which is not a big city so it's very there were maybe like 10 lesbians on Tinder it wasn't the best and then like kept trying to like find a community like that in Kansas and then there was LGBTQ plus thing for graduate students that just started happening and then like COVID shut everything down. Here in Austin, like the dating scene is much better, but it's not really something I have a lot of time to do. It's not really a huge priority compared to my job. There's a really good and relatively large LGBTQ plus community of grad students in the math department and they've sort of accepted me even though I'm a postdoc. It's meant a lot. I mean, I feel like I fit in in that sort of queer space in a way that I don't fit in in the average normal space. And it's meant a lot to see that existing in a math community in particular. Do you remember where your interest in math kind of began and what that path has looked like for you? I was not very good at math. Or I didn't really feel very good at math until high school when I had a really good math teacher. But when I asked him about possible careers or jobs in math, like he had no idea. He didn't know how to answer that question. So I was interested but didn't know what to do. And then went to undergrad to like a small private Lutheran college for the first year. And I tested out of Calculus 1, but it, it was like such a small school that they didn't offer Calculus 2 in the fall, so I like skipped a semester. I like didn't have any math to take and that made me realize how much I really missed it and wanted to do it. As a math major, still didn't really understand like what I could possibly do with that. The thing that I chose and the thing that is really my dream job and I feel very lucky to be able to do is an academic career in math, so my goal is to be a tenured professor eventually. I've had a couple opportunities where I really had to reflect and make sure that this is what I wanted to do. When I got my master's at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I intended to get my PhD there, but I kept failing the master's exams, which you have to pass in order to get into the PhD part of the program. The graduate chair there told me that even if I managed to pass, he didn't think I should be in the program, like I wasn't good enough. Failing those master's exams was very difficult. The narrative the faculty would give all of the graduate students is that you could take the exams as many times as you wanted to and it wouldn't really count against you if you failed. And so I did that and then I had them like turn around and tell me that they were looking at my performance on those exams and it just wasn't good enough to be in the PhD program. And that was devastating. I mean just knowing that this is really something that I wanted to do. So instead of passing those exams, I switched to writing a master's thesis and applying to other places to get a PhD. And in the meantime, I was teaching, which wasn't bad. I mean, I also enjoy teaching. I had to reevaluate if I really wanted to be doing this at that time. And I decided that I did. I love doing it and I know it's something that I'm good at. Now other people are also starting to agree with me, but they didn't agree with me that I was good at it for a long time. That just sort of made me angry. Like if I love something and if I'm good at it, then that's what I want to do. There are lots of other options. It's a little tricky for me to describe because there isn't a lot of support in academic math spaces for things outside of academia. Like no one really knows 
how to guide people. But there are a lot of things you can do with a bachelor's degree in mathematics and there are even more things that you can do with a master's or a PhD. Some careers I think people don't necessarily think of when they think of mathematics, but some that I'm familiar with or like know people that do them or I've heard about people that do them. One of them would be working for the government, like uh, the NSA or the CIA will regularly hire mathematicians. I had a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee who spends his summers working for the NSA in coding. Another thing is working for investment firms. There's a website where you go to to apply for jobs when you're a PhD, it's called Math Jobs org and mostly it's positions listed by universities and colleges but there's also a bunch of investment firms that post to that website and I think they don't really care what specific type of math you do they're just interested in people that are capable of getting a PhD in math because then they're probably capable of doing what they need them to do in the math and STEAM spaces, I did not feel there was a lot of space for LGBTQ plus individuals, but that was also sort of like more in the back of my mind because like the glaring thing to me was that there wasn't space for women. The bisexuality part is doesn't really come up as much, like maybe it comes up more in like casual spaces where I just mention it and people are generally cool with it. The non-binary part, probably a lot of people had this experience where like maybe you didn't talk about it but then we were all on zoom and you got to like display your pronouns on zoom so that was more visibility than i was used to having but i never really got any feedback at all from anyone about it so i don't know <laughs> because there are quite a few people in the lgbt Q plus community as graduate students in UT Austin's math department. Sometimes we have events to get together as queer people and hang out. That's been really nice. That's sort of a new thing that I that I get to do, sort of like be queer and also be a mathematician with other <laughs> queer mathematicians. True equity and inclusion for people in STEAM and the LGBTQ plus community would look like being able to walk into a room if you are teaching or learning or working or collaborating and being able to see other people that look like you, other people that look like you on the outside or once you get to know them, other people that look like you on the inside. There are a lot of changes that workplaces in general should be making to be more accepting. I will have like a, a better concrete answer for that the more time I spend in my career. It's very difficult to get people to change. So the thing I've found that helps me to focus on is to just do what I personally can do and just be there for people like if they seek me out as a resource. And what's really sort of great is that I've already been able to see like people responding to that even though I haven't been doing this for very long. A huge barrier to getting into STEAM spaces is self-confidence and also maybe just knowing other people who do what you want to do or having those other people look like you. Succeeding in these fields is hard to do even for cis straight white males. Every marginalized identity that someone holds, like whether it's LGBTQ+, or being a person of color, or being a first generation college student, like every single one of those adds another level of difficulty to success and it's a lot easier if you have people to talk to about it. I definitely bring an understanding of how difficult it is to succeed. I'm teaching a class this semester. This is the first class that I've taught that's sort of upper level above calculus. So I have a lot of students that are math majors, which is really fun. I know how difficult that is, and I try to make my classroom a safe space like for anyone just because being a math major is difficult, but just like life in general is difficult, especially for undergraduates. A lot of People who maybe haven't had to struggle as much in their careers don't really understand that at all. Representation is important. It's really just because there are people from marginalized identities who just want to be part of a certain career and everyone should have that opportunity to do what they want. Speaking as someone who wasn't sure that I would be able to succeed in this career for a long time, but I really wanted to the whole time. Like that's a really heartbreaking feeling and I don't think that anyone should have to go through that. The advice I would give is that if they love something and they work hard enough and maybe the trickiest part is finding the right people that could help them, then they could have the career that they want. If you want to stay in academia and mathematics, you need to go to grad school, which is a, sort of a huge thing. If you want to just sort of get into math and do something with math for a career, you probably still want to have a bachelor's in math. There are 
lots of different opportunities and as an undergraduate to get more exposure to that. For example, UT Austin does conferences specifically for undergraduates in mathematics and that is a good way to get a taste for what that could look like. I didn't know what the whole deal was with graduate school and just sort of figured it out as I went along and I think a lot of people are like that, like maybe they love doing math or love doing something else but they don't know it's really an option. It is an option, it is very difficult. I would not recommend graduate school for to anyone who didn't love the subject. But if you love the subject and you think it's what you want to do, then I definitely recommend it. I sort of have a unique situation because I got my master's and then took about a year and a half off and then started a PhD program at a different school. So I really did not know what I was doing during my master's, but then I sort of figured it out a bit more and then got to, like in a sense, start over. One thing is the time commitment, like it takes a lot of time. The other thing is hopefully you have grad students that you can hang out with and do work with because it's a lot easier to succeed with other people. and you will always feel like you don't know anything like during the entirety of graduate school and that's normal. Personal sacrifice is truly not actually necessary to succeed in what you want to do, but depending on your background, that might just be the way that things work out. I think one of the reasons my work goals sort of subsumed my personal goals is that I unconsciously sort of realized that my work goals were a way to also satisfy my personal goals because I'm sort of a person who's always had a hard time just fitting in in general. Even though the community is largely cis, straight, and male, I still fit in with that community in a way that I don't elsewhere. The advice I would give to my younger self, which I am also starting to give to people who are younger than me, is that your 20s might be like a nightmare hellscape, but your 30s, hopefully we'll get better. And I realized once I was into my 30s, I started therapy. <laughs> I read a lot of self-help books. I learned how to love myself, and I think that that's really important.